Hi, I'm Erin Morley. I'm thrilled to be singing for you today. This song is called Woman Arise from the Utah Suffragist Hymn Book, and it was sung to the tune of Hope of Israel. Hi, my name is Nyland McBain and I'm the CEO of Better Days 2020. In the spring of 1895, exactly 125 years ago, two very significant events happened in this building behind me, the Salt Lake City and County Building in downtown Salt Lake City. First of all, the Utah Territory had the opportunity to write a new constitution and become a state. And the debates about what that constitution should include happened in this building behind me. That was significant because the delegates to that constitution decided to include women's suffrage in the new Utah State Constitution, making Utah the third state in the nation to give women their right to vote in their constitutions. Secondly, a few weeks after that constitution was drafted, Susan B. Anthony and Reverend Anna Howard Shaw, national suffrage leaders who were famous in their day, came to participate in the Rocky Mountain Suffrage Conference, part of which was also held in this building behind me. This visit by two national luminaries was a big deal. These were the women who were leading the national struggle to win women's rights to vote. And they had come all the way to Utah from their Eastern homes. The conference was covered by every local newspaper and was called a good old fashioned love fest. And thousands of women from around the country gathered right here in Utah to celebrate some of the early triumphs of the equal suffrage movement, including the recent triumphs right here in Utah. Better Days 2020 is dedicated to amplifying Utah women's history, so we can't let this important anniversary pass by unnoticed. But because we can't be together in person right now to celebrate the anniversary of Miss Anthony's important visit. Better Days 2020 brings you this digital celebration, a collection of scholars, leaders, actors, and authors who bring to life these two significant moments in Utah women's history. Today, we honor the thousands of women across Utah who took a stand and worked to break down barriers to their political participation in the 1890s and in the years ever since. Seeking a wider sphere of influence, they worked tirelessly for women's voting rights, both locally and nationally. These Utah women helped make the larger story of suffrage possible, and their legacy inspires us to carry their work forward today. We invite you to enjoy this special tribute to these trailblazing women and this very important time in Utah's history. The story of suffrage in Utah begins at this building, the Council Hall. 
In 1870, when Utah was still a territory, the Utah Territorial Legislature voted unanimously to give Utah women citizens the right to participate in political elections. The legislature met on the upstairs floor of this building. The legislature of the Territory of Wyoming had also granted their women the right to vote a few months earlier. But Utah held two elections in which women voted before Wyoming women went to the polls. On February 14, 1870, school teacher Seraph Young cast the first ballot under an equal suffrage law right here inside the building. She was the first American woman to vote under laws that gave her voting rights equal to men's, making Utah the site of one of the suffrage movement's earliest triumphs. One of the leaders of Utah's women in the years following that first vote was Sarah M. Kimball. She's going to tell us now about what happened next. Greetings, I am Sarah M. Kimball. Here in Utah, women first won the right to vote in 1870, and I helped make it happen. I led the meeting where Utah women first demanded the right to vote. Soon after, we became the first female citizens in the nation to exercise that right under an equal suffrage law. Right after the Utah Territorial Legislature unanimously extended the right to vote to Utah women in 1870, I publicly proclaimed myself a woman's rights woman. I have worked for the cause ever since. I helped organize classes that first year to teach Utah women about civic participation, and we actively voted for 17 years until the federal government took away our right to vote in 1887 in order to try to end polygamy. Many of us were outraged at losing suffrage, so we went right to work organizing our own official chapter of the National Woman Suffrage Association, determined to win back our right to vote. I helped establish and lead the Utah Territory Women's Suffrage Association. Women throughout the territory got behind the movement. Like hundreds of their fellow Utah suffragists, women in Uinta County organized a suffrage association and committed their efforts to regaining female citizen voting rights. Between 1889 and 1895, women's suffrage associations were organized in 21 counties and in over 50 cities and towns across Utah. These women met regularly to educate themselves and their community on issues of equal rights. They also held fundraisers and marched in local parades to bring attention to the cause of suffrage. We worked tirelessly to gain and maintain support for women's political rights, reaching throughout Utah, but also working closely with our counterparts in the national suffrage movement. I never could have done so much for equal suffrage in Utah if it had not been for the influence of Susan B. Anthony. Looking back on the impact that reading Miss Anthony's newspaper, The Revolution, had on me, even before I first gained the right to vote, I later declared, Years ago, I would not have dared to say the bold, grand things that Miss Anthony said, but the seed was planted within my soul, and I have been laboring for the same cause. I came to realize education and agitation are our best weapons of warfare. The suffragists of the city of Richfield in Sevier County met in Relief Society halls like this one. As part of their suffrage activity, women in Richfield lobbied both the Democrat and Republican parties in, uh, in the fall of 1894 to support inserting an equal suffrage clause into the proposed state constitution. They did all in their power to ensure that those who were elected as delegates to the Constitutional Convention of 1895 would support equal voting rights for Utah women citizens. In the spring of 1895, Utah Territory was on the brink of finally becoming a state. We suffragists seized the chance to win our rights back with the new state constitution. They gathered here in the new Salt Lake City and County Building, an impressive Gothic structure in downtown Salt Lake City. Our members from the Utah Women's Suffrage Association also gathered together in this building at the time in the courtroom just down the hall from where the men were meeting. 
we wrote and hand delivered a detailed petition reminding the men of both political parties that they had promised to include equal rights for women in the Constitution. We were willing to do whatever it took to make sure our rights were reinstated with this new state constitution. I'm Erin Mendenhall, Mayor of Salt Lake City. In March and April of 1895, the proposed constitution for the new state of Utah was drafted in this room, which is now the formal chambers of the Salt Lake City Council. 107 male delegates gathered for 65 days of discussion and debate, deciding what they wanted their new state to represent. Because Utah women had previously voted for 17 years, and because the Women's Suffrage Association had worked hard to secure pledges of support from almost all of the Constitutional Convention delegates, the suffragists were confident that they would get their way. But surprisingly, women's voting rights became the most hotly debated issue of the Constitutional Convention. This was because one delegate, B.H. Roberts, suggested that including women's suffrage in the state constitution would jeopardize Utah's chances of getting the constitution approved by the people and by the federal government. He proposed that giving women the right to vote should wait until after statehood was secure. It was a hard fight. B.H. Roberts' arguments were as old as the suffrage movement itself. Women would be sullied by their excursion into politics the peaceful sphere of home would be shattered. Feminine dependence on man would be eradicated against the will of God. Robert's arguments were slippery and convincing to many. Suppose a man comes home after struggling for the success of his candidate and is met at the door by a wife opposed to him in politics, and again he has to go over the fight on tariff of free trade? or else observe a sullen silence because of the impropriety of engaging in such a discussion with his wife. Where then will the brow be cleared of the frown, and the heart lose some of its bitterness, so he may have some milk of human kindness running in his veins? Gentlemen, leave the home as it is. Women be content to reign over the empire of domestic life, and it will bring more joy to your hearts than all the success you could have in casting your ballots at the polls. Leave man, I say, some asylum, some refuge from the storms and cares of life. Fortunately, we had several powerful weapons of our own at our disposal. First, a delegate named Orson F. Whitney. Now, now, Mr. Roberts, you say that women should be satisfied that at the polls they are represented by their husbands. I tried to convince my wife that this is the correct philosophy just the other night. I had stepped into the theater and witnessed a play in progress, and later, reaching home, I endeavored to persuade Mrs. Whitney that she had witnessed the performance as well, that I had represented her there. It did not work. <laughs> now. I believe in a future for women. I, I do not believe that she was made merely for a wife, a mother, a cook, and a housekeeper. These callings, however honorable, and no one doubts that they are so, are not the sum of her capabilities. It is a woman's destiny to have a voice in the affair of government. She was designed for it. She has a right to it. This great social upheaval, this Women's movement that is making itself heard and felt means something more than that certain women are ambitious to vote and hold office. I regard it as one of the great levers by which the Almighty is lifting up this fallen world, lifting it nearer to the throne of its creator. We also benefited from the advocacy of Delegate Franklin S. Richards, husband of one of our best organizers, Emily Richards. Franklin also spoke eloquently about the need for women to have our political rights. I have never known a woman who felt complimented by the statement that she was too good to exercise the same rights and privileges as a man. Equal suffrage will prove the brightest and purest ray of Utah's glorious star. It will shine forever in the immortal galaxy as a beacon light on the tops of the mountains beckoning our sister states and territories upward and onward to the higher plane of civilization and the fuller measure of civil and religious liberty. 
Lastly, we women were led by a unique leader, Emmeline B. Wells. Emmeline had already served for decades as the editor of the Woman's Exponent, a suffrage newspaper that published thousands of editorials and articles about women gaining their rights and becoming independent. It also published poems, such as this one by Laura Hyde Minor, published on May 15, 1895. Tis asked, what is a woman's sphere? How should she act her part? Is it to wear a smiling face, to hide an aching heart? To speak in accents soft and low, her irate lord to soothe, with aching brow and weary hand, his pathway render smooth? This once was thought a woman's lot, her only aim in life. But now she shines in every home, companion, friend, or wife. So, with her heart and soul combined, and conscience holding sway, her sphere is ever spreading out, where wisdom points the way. I am Emmeline B. Wells. In 1895, I was the president of the Utah Territorial Women's Suffrage Association. I led a massive effort among women throughout the territory of Utah to submit petitions to the Constitutional Convention delegates. This was to show support for women's suffrage being included in the new state constitution and was a huge undertaking. Pro suffrage petitions were received from residents of 26 of the 27 counties with thousands of signatures on them. Women's suffrage associations like the one led by Electa Bullock in Utah County were prepared to overcome the opposition mounted by B.H. Roberts at the convention. Their previous six years of public education, outreach, and activism motivated them to make their voices heard in the spring of 1895. Thousands of Utah citizens signed pro-suffrage petitions that were then sent to delegates in Salt Lake City. Residents of Cache County alone collected over 2,000 signatures. Female suffragists like Caroline Affleck and Mary Anderson organized and sent petitions to the convention from Logan. Even though they were far removed geographically from the Constitutional Convention in Salt Lake City, rural suffragists around the territory found additional ways to show support for the suffrage cause. Sarah Elliott of Moab, Grand County, was a school teacher and local women's suffrage association president. She and her students planted two suffrage trees on Arbor Day, 1895. They tied yellow ribbons around the tree trunks in honor of Susan B. Anthony and Emmeline B. Wells. With statehood on the horizon, Utah suffragists joined forces and worked to ensure that the new state constitution would reinstate women's suffrage. Our very active suffrage association members lobbied, petitioned, and ultimately prevailed as the debates raged between B.H. Roberts and the other delegates on whether or not to include equal suffrage in the proposed constitution, the words of my friend Susan B. Anthony kept returning to my mind. She warned, do not be tricked into thinking we could obtain our rights separately after statehood. She said, once ignored in your constitution, you'll be as powerless to secure recognition as we are in the older states. Happily, our efforts yielded the results we desired. On April 18, 1895, the Constitutional Convention voted in favor of including women's suffrage in the new Constitution. This restored Utah women's citizens' right to vote. Utah was to be the third state in the nation to include equal suffrage in its Constitution. This proposed Constitution not only restored women's right to vote, but allowed us to hold public office for the first time. The Utah State Constitution reads in Article 4, Section 1, the rights of citizens of the state of Utah to vote and hold office shall not be denied or abridged on account of sex. Both male and female citizens of this state shall enjoy equally all civil, political, and religious rights and privileges. <laughs>
spring of 1895 was truly unforgettable, just a few weeks after equal suffrage had been included in the Utah State Constitution. National women suffrage leaders, Susan B. Anthony and Reverend Anna Howard Shaw arrived in Salt Lake City via train to congratulate Utah women in person. Together, they hosted the Rocky Mountain Suffrage Conference. I will never forget arriving at the train depot in Salt Lake City with Reverend Anna Howard Shaw on Sunday morning, May 12, 1895. So much had changed since my first visit here in 1871 when I was accompanied by my good friend Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We arrived soon after Utah women first gained the right to vote. Now in 1895, a procession of 72 women met us at the train station and showed us a very fine time indeed. The Rocky Mountain Suffrage Conference was covered by every news outlet in Utah and the Intermountain West. It was also covered by the Utah Plain Dealer. The Utah Plain Dealer was a newspaper started by Elizabeth Taylor and her husband, William. My name is Elizabeth Austin Taylor. My husband, William and I were very politically active in Salt Lake City and 1895 was a landmark year in many ways. That year, I helped my husband establish and begin his work as the editor of the Utah Plain Dealer, one of six newspapers for our Black community in Salt Lake City. We printed that newspaper weekly for more than a decade and used it to campaign for the Republican Party and to advocate for social and political equality in Utah. I also served as the secretary for the Colored Women's Republican Club, and I also helped to bring and bind women together by organizing and leading the Western Federation of Colored Women. Now, I was no stranger to discrimination. The very presence of the Colored Women's Republican Club, in addition to the other Women's Republican Club, should tell you a little something about how included we felt in the mainstream organizations of women. And we might have often been on the margins, but Utah's small population of Black women and men voted and actively participated in party politics. We were passionately invested in our rights and engaged in the lively political events of 1895. Local newspapers like ours covered all the details of the Rocky Mountain Suffrage Conference which was held from May 12th through May 15th, 1895. People from all over the state wanted to know exactly what the famous visitors did during their stay here in Utah. That first day of Susan B. Anthony's visit, Emmeline Wells, along with her other leading ladies, showed her all around Salt Lake City and the big red omnibus that was nicknamed the Utah Drag. They held an elegant luncheon at the Templeton Hotel, and each event was expertly orchestrated by Emmeline and her organizing committee. Emmeline B. Wells and her fellow Utah suffragists attended many suffrage conventions on behalf of American women. They attended conventions in New York, Atlanta, Boston, and Washington, D.C. They also came here to the U.S. Capitol to tell the Congress that participating in politics didn't strip a woman of her femininity or make her a bad wife and mother. People were afraid of women entering politics, and the women of Utah proved that there was nothing to fear. Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon testified to Congress in 1898, none of the unpleasant results which were predicted have occurred. The sky didn't fall when women voted. Utah women came to Washington many times as the national suffrage movement increased pressure on Congress to pass an amendment to the U.S. Constitution for women's suffrage. Hannah Ka'apa 
from Yosepa was another Utah woman who spoke to a national audience in Washington, D.C. In 1899, she asked the National Council of Women to support women's voting rights in her native Hawaii, which had just been annexed as a territory of the United States. As I was presiding over the organization of this Rocky Mountain Suffrage Conference in Salt Lake City, I wanted it to be as elegant as those national conventions I had attended with other Utah ladies. After the luncheon and tour of Salt Lake City, Susan Anthony and Reverend Shaw spoke in the tabernacle to 6,000 women from all over the nation. Our territorial governor, Governor West, introduced Susan B. Anthony first. Oh, reporters were jotting down their words as fast as they possibly could. This is the second time recently that I have had the distinction of being introduced by a governor. The first time was just a few days ago in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I wish to ask each of you today, why is it that these two mountain states have led the nation in regards to acknowledging women's unalienable rights? What is it about your lands, your people, that has allowed the vision of liberty to take root and flourish? I congratulate you on showing a sense of justice and generosity to the women of Utah. I feel that Utah will go on and become the greatest of the mountain states. The Reverend Anna Howard Shaw also spoke. She became the first woman to preach from the pulpit of the tabernacle and she brought down the house. Yesterday, as the train carried me through the vast and mighty mountains, climbing a craggy precipice on one side, descending carefully on the other, I could realize something of the courageous manhood and womanhood, which it cost to subdue these rugged precincts and bring the valleys to their present conditions. We gather today to celebrate Utah's entrance into the union of the third state with its women free and enfranchised. This was accomplished at the hands of legions of women throughout the territory and at the hand of your constitutional delegates. We expected it of the men of Utah. No man in this territory could have stood by his mother, having heard her tell of all that the pioneers had endured and refused to grant her the same right of liberty he wanted for himself and still feel worthy of such a mother. Utah is one of the crown jewels of our union, on the crest of the Rockies above and ahead of all of the others. Utah is dear to the heart of every woman who loves liberty in these United States. The conference continued with speeches by suffrage leaders from around Utah, as well as visitors from Colorado and other neighboring states. After the decades of division in the suffrage movement over the issue of polygamy, this was a welcome moment of unity. Women came together across religious and political lines to report on their work for the advancement of women and honor each other's achievements. Thousands gathered at the Tabernacle, the Salt Lake Theater, and the Salt Lake City and County Building for several more sessions. On Monday night, May 13th, prominent suffragist Emily Richards and her husband, the well-loved constitutional delegate Franklin S. Richards, hosted 300 distinguished guests at their home on A Street in the Avenues. The Richards reception took place in the home behind me. Although it's difficult to imagine, this was a grand affair. Imagine the front door thrown open, the tables filled with flowers and yellow draping, the color of the suffrage movement. The reception was to honor Susan B. Anthony and Anna Howard Shaw and leading Colorado suffragists. People from across Utah were excited to meet and interact with these important visitors. The next afternoon on Tuesday, May 14th, Mrs. Wells hosted 150 of the most select out-of-town visitors on a trip to Saltaire, a lakeside resort which had just been built on the shores of the Great Salt Lake. It was called the Coney Island of the West. The suffragists took the 2.15 p.m. train out, and they had so many women in their group that two additional cars were added on to the train. The women spent the afternoon strolling through the Saltaire Pavilion, eating a picnic lunch, and a few even went swimming in the Great Salt Lake. 
You can imagine the novelty for these visitors of floating in a lake with such high salt content. The excursion was a welcome break from convention meetings, and it was also an opportunity to deepen the camaraderie between Utah suffragists and those from other states. The party to say farewell to the distinguished visitors was smaller than it had been to greet them. It was partly because Miss Anthony and Reverend Shaw weren't going far. They departed Salt Lake City for Ogden, where they again spoke to a large crowd. On Thursday, May 16th, Miss Anthony and Reverend Shaw left Utah by train for San Francisco, California. There they would preside over another suffrage conference. But the impact of their visit lingered. On November 5, 1895, the men of Utah voted to accept the new constitution of the state of Utah. With suffrage included, 31,305 voted to ratify it. 7,676 voted against ratification. Although the women couldn't yet vote on the Constitution themselves, they showed their support for the process by serving lunch in all of the voting precincts. On January 4, 1896, President Grover Cleveland officially made Utah the 45th state in the Union. It is the third state with its women able to vote. The personal relationships developed between Utah suffragists and national leaders were immensely important. Susan B. Anthony was one of the staunchest advocates for Utah women's right to vote. She had defended that right even when other women's leaders had urged Congress to disenfranchise Utah women in the 1880s as a way to end polygamy. To show their appreciation for Susan B. Anthony's ongoing support, the women of Utah sent Anthony a bolt of black silk produced in their women-owned silk industry as a gift for her 80th birthday in 1900. Anthony had, cher had a cherished dress made from the silk, which today is displayed in her bedroom at the National Susan B. Anthony Museum and House in Rochester, New York. Susan B. Anthony passed away in 1906 more than a decade before the 19th Amendment extended women's voting rights across the country. On the day of her death, she had one of her gold rings sent to Emmeline B. Wells in Utah, a symbol of their friendship. The story didn't end there. Many Utah women ran for state and local office now that they were able to do so. In November, 11 women were elected to county offices and three were elected to the state legislature. In Salt Lake City, Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon ran as a Democrat in an at-large election for one of five Senate seats. Her husband, Angus, women's leader, Emmeline B. Wells, and Elizabeth Taylor's husband, William, were also on the ballot as Republican candidates. Democrats swept the election and Martha's victory garnered national attention. Not only was she the first woman elected to a state Senate, but she also defeated her own husband. As a Utah State Senator, Dr. Cannon authored bills that revolutionized public health and sanitation in Utah, including establishing Utah's first state board of health. She sometimes scattered yellow flower petals on the desk of male legislators as a symbol of women's suffrage and the influence she and her fellow female legislators wielded. In this protracted gleam called life before you were a mother or a wife you crossed an ocean you crossed the plains you were no stranger to the pain as a child did you understand
just a woman in the West. You put convention to the test. You never listened if they said, girl, you can't. You were a doctor and a leader. Scopes. You helped your sisters get the vote Through all your struggles and your complicated life You were still there to shine the light And in your time you fought for better days you believed a woman should have a say And the spark of your ambition showed the way to better days And some may say you came before your time But we needed you at just the time you came so if my heart should long for better days Thanks to you I know that I can have a say You still shine a light that shows the way To better days Better days Better days The fight for women's equal voting rights continued on into the 20th century. In 1904, I organized the Western Federation of Colored Women, inviting all Black women from all over the Western United States to join me in my mission to help the fallen. I printed another newspaper, the Western Women's Advocate, as part of the Federation. Sadly, even with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, the battle for equal voting rights continued on for women of color. After they won their own voting rights, Utah women continued to fight for women everywhere. They raised money, signed petitions, marched in parades, spoke at conventions, lobbied politicians. They pressured their senators and congressmen to meet with suffrage leaders on the steps of the Capitol and to work for an amendment to the Constitution for women's voting rights. Two Utah women even held up picket signs in front of the White House in a silent protest. They were arrested and brutally mistreated in prison in 1917. It was called the Night of Terror. After 50 years of active participation in the national suffrage movement, Utah suffragists celebrated here at the Utah State Capitol when the 19th Amendment was finally ratified in August of 1920. The amendment states that the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It was a great step forward for American women, but it was certainly not the end of the story. Even after the passage of the 19th Amendment, many women of color in Utah continue to fight for equal access to the ballot box. National citizenship laws block Native Americans from the vote, and across the country, this was extremely challenging for African Americans with poll tax, literacy tests, and other obstacles that they had to face on their way to gaining the right to vote. Today, I'm standing on historic 25th Street in Ogden, Utah, where Miss Annabelle Wheatley Matson, who was dubbed the Queen of 25th Street, provided a safe place for people of all backgrounds to come together to help live out the freedoms that were guaranteed, guaranteed to them through the Constitution. So the struggle continues and the NAACP has continued to be at the front of that struggle to maintain that we not only have the right to vote, but we maintain that right.
and discriminatory laws throughout the nation often kept African Americans from participation at the polls. Federal legislation, including the landmark Voting Rights Act of 1965, helped knock down many legal barriers. Although the struggle for true political equality continues today. Throughout the years since Utah women gained and regained the right to vote, thousands of Utah women have engaged in crucial efforts to continue to expand women's influence and social equality. This park is named for Mignon Barker Richmond, one such human rights activist and community leader right here in Salt Lake City. We're grateful you joined us today for this celebration of events which happened 125 years ago, but which still impact each one of us every day in 2020. Understanding where we come from as Utahns has the power to make us stronger in the future, to give us confidence in our ability to truly make Utah the crown jewel of the Rockies, as Susan B. Anthony said. On August 26, 2020, we as a nation will commemorate the centennial of the 19th Amendment, a constitutional amendment that extended women's voting rights throughout the nation, 50 years after Utah women first voted, and 25 years after Utah became a suffrage state. But the early suffrage triumphs in Western states like Utah have been largely overlooked in the national celebrations this year. It's time to rectify that. Better Days 2020 has published several books for this anniversary year that focus on Utah women's contributions. First of all, Thinking Women, A Timeline of Suffrage in Utah by Katherine Kitterman and Rebecca Clark is available now from Deseret Book and in stores and in online. Secondly, Champions of Change, 25 Women Who Made History by Naomi Watkins and Katherine Kitterman has illustrations by Brooke Smart, some of which you have seen in the video today. You can also find both of these books on Amazon. Lastly, my own book, Pioneering the Vote, The Untold Story of Suffragists in Utah and the West, will be coming out later this summer from Shadow Mountain and is available now for pre-order. We encourage you to delve into this history even more deeply with these three books. These are the better days our foremothers envisioned, but we have better days yet ahead of us. Thank you.